Hey guys, welcome to the first video for chapter 27. And chapter 27 is going to be on nationalism and revolution around the world. So World War I had a huge impact throughout the world. Uh, aside from the damages and changes to the central powers, there was the talk about self-determination during the Paris Peace Conference. And for a lot of people throughout the world, this stirred feelings of nationalism and a call for independence, right? You know, it kind of was trying to turn away from the conquest and imperialism of the 1800s and saying, hey, we should be able to rule ourselves. That's what the 14 points were about and so forth. So in this one, we're going to be talking about how the spirit of nationalism and revolution spread in several parts of the world. So first, we're going to be looking at Latin America. Right? We've got scenes from the Mexican Revolution here, uh, this picture on the left. We're also going to be talking about some other areas of the world, Gandhi we're going to be talking about, but also Africa, the Middle East, and so forth. But in Latin America, we're going to be talking about the Mexican Revolution. Now, the easiest way to digest all the details of the Mexican Revolution is to first go through several of the key individuals um, that we, uh, were involved in it. Now, it starts due to the rule of Porfirio Diaz. Uh, Diaz was officially a president, but he was actually a dictator who ruled for uh, about 35 years. And during his rule, Mexico appeared to be doing well economically. Uh, but this was because he actively encouraged foreign investment. Uh, you know, he wanted foreigners to invest in Mexican mines and railroads and oil fields. Now, all the benefits of this foreign money only benefited a select few, though. It only benefited the rich. Most Mexicans remained poor peasants. Diaz eventually found himself opposed by several groups. Uh, the poor peasants didn't like him because they were unhappy with being forced to work for really low wages. The middle class reformers uh, had had enough of Diaz's dictatorship and they wanted democracy. And the upper class uh, elites resented the power of foreign investors. And so this led to a nationalist call to reclaim Mexican resources. So with opposition coming from all sides, Diaz eventually resigned, leading to Francisco Madero coming to power. Now, Madero was one of those liberal reformers who called for democratic changes even before Diaz left power. And he was elected president in 1911 in a free democratic election. He wasn't president for very long, though, and he was succeeded by Victoriano Huerta. You know what? We'll just throw all this up here I'll, while we'll go through it. You guys can figure it out. Uh, he was a general in the Mexican army and he led a military overthrow of Madero in 1913. We'll talk a little more about that later. But after claiming power, Huerta established himself as a dictator. All right. So we got, they had a one little time as a elected democracy and then they went right back to being a dictatorship in 1913 and he rolled back a lot of the democratic reforms of Madero. He was opposed by several factions. Some of them led by Francisco Pancho Villa and Emiliana Zapata. Uh, both of these were peasant rebel leaders. They led different groups. This is Villa and this is Zapata. Um, Villa led a kind of a, a the northern Mexican uprising uh, and Zapata uh, was more in the south. He had a large following of uh, Aztec or people of, of Aztec and Mayan ancestry. The Mestizos, remember the mix of European and Native Americans. Uh, eventually they formed a coalition, all right. So both of these guys form a coalition with this guy, uh, Venustiano Carranza. Uh, Carranza was a wealthy landowner and he became president in 1917. So now that you know the key players, let's look at some of the key events. In 1911, um, Diaz resigns. Okay, so he steps down. He was not thrown out in violence. And then in 1913, Madero is assassinated. Right he, after he's elected in free elections, there's a plot by his top general Huerta, and Madero is killed. And then Huerta becomes president. In 1914, Huerta resigns after fighting against the coalition of Carranza, Villa, and, Zap and Zapata. That same year, Carranza breaks his alliance with Villa and Zapata, so you know turns his back on them, so to speak. And then in 1917, uh, Carranza, uh, Carranza is elected president and a new constitution is drafted. Villa and Zapata continued to fight against this new government. They, for obvious reasons, were very upset with Carranza. Uh, and then in 1919, Villa is defeated and Zapata is assassinated. So Carranza is now the only guy left standing. All right, so let's look at the diagram real quick, just to go to uh, back with the pictures. So you start off with Diaz, then you go to Madero. Madero the, makes it seem like he's bringing democracy, but two years into his rule, he is assassinated by a plot led by one of his top generals, Huerta. Huerta becomes a dictator, and then he is opposed by the coalition of all three of these guys, right? You got your two rebel leaders, and then your kind of more established wealthy landowner, Carranza, until eventually he just X's out both of these guys, and then Carranza is the only one left standing. Got it? 
good. So let's get into the effects of the revolution. Now, any revolution is going to have significant effects, but the biggest effect after the Mexican Revolution was the creation of a new constitution in 1917. It set out to correct a lot of the problems that led to the revolution in the first place. First thing it did, it allowed nationalization of natural resources. Now, remember we talked earlier how Mexico was rich in natural resources, but foreign countries and businesses were in control of them thanks to Diaz's government policies. The new constitution made the Mexican government in control of them, right? So nationalization means Mex I'm not even going to bother with that. You guys get the idea. Mexican government is now going to be in charge of the natural resources. Another thing it did, it distributed the land more equally. So it wasn't dominated by the rich landowners, which is kind of ironic because that's what Carranza did, was. It also gave more rights to workers and women. Now, while political instability would continue in Mexico for the next couple of years, in 1929, things settled down a little bit with the Institutional Revolutionary Party, also known as the PRI, uh, when this took control. It was a political party that sought to incorporate several groups. Right? Incorporate means bring together. Uh, it won the support of business leaders, military, military leaders, peasants, and workers, right? So from all social classes and, and factions. Now, using such a broad base, it remained in control control of Mexico and really dominated Mexican politics for about 70 years. All right, so a lot that I threw at you there, but you know, uh, with the Mexican Revolution, the big thing that we want to get through is with the Constitution about kind of taking control away from uh, foreign uh, investors and foreign businesses, right? You know, and kind of trying to bring a little bit more of equality and fairness uh, to Mexico. All right, so that wraps it up for this one. And in the next one, we're going to be getting into nationalists and independence movements in Africa and the Middle East.